Hello and welcome to our discussion on European language centres in higher education, the next generation. We are in the video studio of the Europa Universität Viadrina in Frankfurt an der Oder, which is right at the Polish border. My name is Thomas Vogel and I've been the director of the Viadrina Language Centre now for over 20 years, since the founding of the university in 1992. I've also been the host of the annual WILCO meetings, the annual WILCO meetings of directors of language centres in higher education. These annual meetings have grown into an influential, informal network of around 60 language learning and teaching institutions in 20 different countries. This meeting, which is actually the eighth meeting, is the reason why both of my guests are here. To my right, Libor Stepanek, he is the director of the Language Center of Masaryk University in Brno in the Czech Republic. And he's been, as, as far as I understand, you've been appointed to that position uh, just recently, the yeah. probably last, last year. And to my left, um, somebody who actually doesn't need any introduction in the uh, professional scene, uh, Nick Byrne, who is the director of the Language Center of the London School of Economics and Political Science. Nick has actually, much probably much to the dismay of his own colleagues, decided to step down this year and to retire. And by the look of his face, <laughs> he doesn't seem to be regretting it. <laughs> Welcome uh, to both of you. I'm happy to have you here. The theme of this year's Vulco meeting is the next generation. And indeed, the last couple of years have witnessed a lot of changes in the leadership of European language centers at universities. All and Vulco, we want to smooth the, the transition between the previous and the next generation by simply providing a platform where experienced and new directors can exchange ideas ask questions and transfer the knowledge. So Volker has become basically a repository of knowledge as far as language learning and, and teaching at universities is concerned. Now let's begin with this, this kind of exchange of ideas and information. To First of all, to play up to the curiosity of our colleagues, um, let's begin with home stories. Um, let's picture a scene, Nick. A scene in a kindergarten in Manchester. Little Nick, among his friends, they talk about what they want to be later in life. <laughs> Little John says, I want to be an astronaut. Uh, somebody says, well, I would like to be a milkman, a firefighter, a nurse. Those kind of ideas come up. No, says Little Nick, I know exactly what I want to be. I want to be the director of a university language center. Nick, that's the story, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. That's exactly how it happened. I knew from an early age, actually, in the kindergarten, it would have, if I'd said anything, it would have been I wanted to be an actor. Okay. That would have and you me. did become one. <laughs> it, well, I think, actually, if you're talking about the profession of teaching, that and acting is very, very similar. And I think that since nearly all of us have our background in teaching to become... Uh, language centre directors, although that could change as well. I think that actually forms quite an important part. Mm. So how did you eventually end up at a university language centre? Um, in, in, a, in a sense, teaching was the key. That mm. When I graduated from university, um, I did toy with the idea of going into acting, because I'd done that at university. I then went through the other sort of um, late 70s things of try the British Council, try the BBC, but they'd actually suspended their training programmes because of the sort of economic crisis at the end of that particular decade. And I was also toying with the idea of going into fashion retail, but I was worried I'd be an absolute parody of myself. But I did that. I remember it was for a company called Jaeger as trainee export manager, looking at the German market. And in a sense, there's a little bit of thing, it would have been interesting to think what would have happened. But what I did decide to do was go into teaching because I okay. really enjoyed my time as an exchange teacher. And it was from that and doing basically 12, 13 years of teaching and then teaching part-time at art and design colleges and then realising there was a whole market for languages for specific purposes. And then a job came up at what's now University of the Arts London. 
and it was an absolute sort of amazing combination. So for me, bass was in teaching, then doing part-time work at universities for specific purposes, and then just really getting a great break mm -hmm. when the job came up. Okay. Libra, teaching, was that at the basis of your decision to be well, in a language centre? Yes, I think that we share a lot of things. because mm. there was You also, also wanted to be an actor. <laughs> well, not really <laughs> wanted to be an actor, but I also did some acting. I did some directing. And uh, after university, where I uh, studied English and history, and I at that time I didn't really think that I would like to go into teaching. But then I started to teach here and there some... Um, small jobs and uh, again I, I just started to really love it so I applied for um, well, a teaching position at a university and then gradually uh, with uh, I don't know projects and different responsibilities I um, got into different positions and um, finally last year I uh, became the director. Yeah <laughs> and you've, you've, you both have never regretted it? No. Uh, or yeah, well yeah. Um, after those Ten months. <laughs> I haven't that. No, no, no. Those ten months actually lead me to the next question: Is that um, how did you actually prepare? I remember when I came uh, into office at Viadrina, I didn't really know what a language center was because at the university where I came from, um, there was no such thing as a university mm. language center. So I didn't have a clue. So how did you? I mean, when you came, you didn't have a kind of. Uh, no. um, a scheme or a or, or a, a idea what what you had yeah. to do. I mean, I I mean, we were actually doing like twenty five years ago, a bit more. It was September nineteen ninety when I um, started at uh, London College of Fashion, which is part of the University of the Arts. I mean, I suppose I was lucky in that I'd been a deputy head of a modern languages department okay. in two schools, so it meant that I knew how a department ran and and. Um, I, I the, just then the managerial side yeah. of it. Yeah. Okay. So I just had to try and sort of learn from that. But again, it was it was a very different ball game. And also I was actually starting up. I had a handful of people. Um, there wasn't a physical centre. Mm. And yeah, you were learning on the job um, mm. and trying to see what models were out there in the other parts of the university. And, um, of course, at the beginning, I had a huge teaching load as well. Okay. So how many hours did you actually have to um, teach at the I beginning? started off with about 18, 20 hours a week. Jesus. Um, and how many colleagues did you have to look after? In oh, a tiny amount. I okay. mean, about uh, five, six, something like that. I mean, it was really small. I mean, now I'm looking after 70, you know, but... Um, those days, it was, it was very, very intensive. Uh, I mean, I understand that you... You were actually the, the, the founding director, if I like to say so, of the language center because there was no language center. Yeah, yeah. So you started so like, very just, like then. Yeah. Like, just like me. Just like me. Yeah. Yeah. Because he didn't. You, that, that was the point. There was nobody you could you could talk to yeah. or you could tell you how to do no. this. No, in fact, it, it was only later that there was the organisation directors of university language okay. centers now become the association, but that was quite a few years down the line. And it was very funny because I remember that because we were art and design institutions, we weren't allowed to be full members. Mm. Um, there was yeah. a couple of other universities yeah. in the same boat, specialist institutions. But then it was really good. I remember the, the, the time when I met other people doing the same job and it was a real sort of feeling of relief. Yeah. Um, and also feeling that you could say, well, yeah, now I can start to learn and discuss. Mm. Okay. But must have been slightly different in your case, right? Because you, <laughs> from the very beginning, you had about one hundred colleagues, and and you had the the the, the, the your preceding head of uh, of department mm. still with you. So what yeah, was it like? Yeah, yeah. I bet well, you said the the first ten months were difficult. <laughs> yes, but I must say that it's a completely different situation. This is a really generational change because mm. uh, I can say that I was extremely lucky of not only having an excellent today ex-director mm -hmm. she was really uh, telling me a lot of ideas and sharing a lot of the knowledge and also she of course introduced me to you mm -hmm. and to the Walker group so I could actually before I uh, from the moment I learned that I would be uh, the director uh, till the moment when I became I had four months of preparation and I was talking to 
many directors. I spent a week with Nick, who was sharing a lot of his uh, well, experience and everything. And I could really um, deal with a lot of different ideas, asking people and listening and listening and listening to all those stories. And um, most of them proved extremely useful then. Wasn't your challenge that you were actually a member of the, the teaching staff of the, the language center and then you all of a sudden you yeah. became yeah. sort of the boss of your <laughs> former peers? Of course, if you have a group of people of 100, uh, it is obvious that not everybody is happy with the idea that uh, I've become He's not been director. Chosen, no. Yes, <laughs> uh, and uh, but um, I think that there were people who um, knew what I could do. A majority basically didn't know me in, in the sense okay. of what I do mm. exactly. So in the first weeks of, of being a director, when I was going uh, from group to group, or team to team, and explain my visions and explain the ideas of what is going to happen and what is going to change and things like that, I think that majority, in majority of cases, the response was really positive. So again, um, but I think that and I repeat that, that I think that we are in a much more easier situation mm. now because we have mm. so many um, senior experienced people to uh, ask for advice, for help, that uh, whenever I had any problem, I simply asked and talked to people who have experienced similar situations. Mm. So in many situations, it was like, it was my first experience, mm. but I knew that it's, was solved by many people before in different ways and I kind of had to only find my own strategy. So you already had a network and I, yeah. I think you didn't have that network at no. the beginning, yeah. right? It's just like me. It, it, and, yeah. I, and I think I mean, the, the sort of the network is such an important thing. I mean, I noticed today on my things from my emails and um, somebody from a university was saying, we're trying to um, restructure, um, create this post. Um, can anybody send me job descriptions, person okay. specs? Yeah. And, you know, that sort of thing, that yeah. in instant, I mean, thanks to technology as well, yeah. you know, it just means you can really help each other. Yeah. And people aren't afraid of sharing. There's less yeah. sort of protectionism. Or, and there's, I think, a lot less feel about feeling, I can't admit I've got a problem. Or, you know, yes. um, it's, it's, it's almost taboo to say, this isn't going well. Okay. I, think th I think that atmosphere has changed mm. as well. I think, which actually leads me to the next question, I think it's quite a lonely job, isn't it, uh, some, sometimes, um, being, being the director. And one of the reasons is, is the problem of, of recognition, mm. of recognition of, of your work within the academic community um, at large. So people, I mean, you said you focused on teaching. Now, teaching is something that a lot of academics are not see don't see as as sort yeah. of the major focus mm. of their of their work. Now, how did you how did you feel? Did you ever feel integrated into this academic community of the LSE? I mean, LSE is a highly prestigious with lots of winners of Nobel prizes and all that. And all of a sudden, there's Nick, uh, who is actually you are an academic, but not a teach a, a researcher as such. So how do you, I mean? How did the the Ac academia, if you, if, you, yeah. if you like, respond to, to you? I, I think that the, the way, I, and again, this is a very personal thing, the way I sort of played it is I wasn't going to try and compete with them on their terms. I remember after my um, job offer, okay. and I accepted it, and I suddenly thought, oh, should I try and, and get a PhD? You know, what am I so <laughs> obsessed about that I could do it? Yeah. I remember asking to the, um, the appointment panel, and one of them just said, oh, heavens no, don't. He said, we already have enough academic divas. <laughs> we don't want another one. Which I thought was rather interesting. Yeah. And um, the way I saw it f for me, that I had to prove myself that I'm just as good as an academic. In, in All this is in inverted commas. Um, using my own field. And I thought, right... What I need to make sure is that we do have a clear academic remit, that we're doing something we can say this is what we call so our, our degree options. Then I realised I could actually get bonus points for good service delivery, support, income generation, applied research. I thought, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing, European projects, okay. which LSE doesn't do very well. In fact, we're the only people that do it. Um, and then, of course, the outreach. And I just thought it, it has been recognised. I, I think that what LSE 
could do, and they're starting to, is recognise that they have this category at British universities, professors in practice, mm -hmm. and that has been really developed for a particular cadre of people that don't have a traditional high-level academic research output in British terms, which also is for government funding. So I think there is a flexibility. But I think anybody has to look at what is my institution? Um, what do I want to fight for? And getting respect is not just about wanting to be called a professor. Mm -hmm. or yeah. it, it really have to, you have to look at yourself, be honest, and look at the institution. Yeah. I mean, you have a PhD in, in political science, not yes. not in, not even in English or in, in language no, no, teaching whatsoever. Uh, so, how did you fit into the academic community in, in your university? Well, uh, I must say that our situation is slightly different because, uh, and again, probably we're lucky just with the university because Masaryk University supports. Um, of the academic part, the language centre is huge. It means that, of course, we do not have the academics, as you're saying, the theoretical, the uh, the research, mm -hmm. which would go into linguistics, literature, and other yeah, yeah, things. Yeah. But we uh, basically focus in research on uh, well the practical th skills and recently, because the university uh, actually needs to have high quality teaching. Mm -hmm. The language centre is one of the centres or one of the institutions within the university. Uh, where we can offer some ideas. I'm not saying all solutions, but some ideas. So uh, I would say that, um, again, I don't compete with academics at the departments of political science or whatever with how many journal publications we have or uh, monographies and this kind of thing. But uh, I think that the respect we're getting is through the, especially through the PhDs, mm -hmm. who we are helping with okay. writing their thesis, uh, with uh, uh, again, well, presentations at conferences and things like that. So you are a service institution. We are, of we I are. mean, that that's some a, a term that a lot of our colleagues would probably not like, <laughs> right? I mean, to to be, be a service, to be yeah, a service institution. Uh, yeah, that's something. What uh, when we talk about the uh, different generations, that's uh, actually I understood. Mm. Uh, from that, that if you provide excellent service, you can actually be proud of what you are doing. And mm -hmm. uh, once you understand that uh, language centre is cannot compete in academic fields with the academics because it is service okay. centre, it is yeah. not research focused. Mm -hmm. academic is, is there anything start being proud? I mean, is there anything you're particularly proud of? Of um, the last uh, 20 years. Yeah, I, th I think the number one is that we have the highest teaching score and the highest satisfaction rate of all of the LSE. And because we get... The Language centres yeah, usually have that, uh, don't they? I mean, really we, have, great. Good, we get good evaluations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's what's interesting. The second one is the Department of Philosophy. And that department actually uses our language degree options, so modules that 25% yeah. of any degree. They actually list ours alongside theirs, so not like an outside option that a lot of universities do. You know, you can do it, it's part of your degree, but it's outside. And I think that's interesting that the, the, um, the departments we work best with have also got good teaching scores. And the ones that actually don't use us as much as they could do okay. tend to have the lower ones. <laughs> There's a moral in that. So definitely I would think it's the teaching that I'm really happy about, our high scores. Yeah. Anything you are already proud of? Yeah, I think it, it, it's very similar. It's a very similar situation that we are actually asked by the department, specific departments, specific faculties, who actually want us to help them with... Um, their teaching with uh, work with students and there is another thing which I'm really proud of it's not my job it's still uh, well a result of uh, my predecessor's job but sometimes we are more successful in projects that are especially focused on teaching and, and on new courses and this kind of thing than some faculties so even in, in the absolute numbers <coughs> mm. we are better sometimes than some of the faculties mm. and it's mm. something that's well, uh, that counts when you see in the graphs of the University Language Centre somewhere in the centre, and then there are still some... So, so there is a bright future for language learning and teaching at university, you think so? Or what are the challenges, actually, at um, the moment? Budget? I th Budget is probably the biggest challenge. Well, yeah. Or are there any other things that... that it, it's funny, in, in, within the UK, 
we've just done um, quite a big sort of survey on this again. And generally, the feeling is still optimistic. Number of students are growing. Um, there are still sort of grumblings about a quick shift here, a reduction there. Um, but the overall pattern is something positive. I think it's a way that we do adapt. Mm. We've also got um, an interesting mix. And the overwhelming majority of our of our um, staff are on permanent contracts, which is very good. So we can really work with it. We have a little bit of room with people on part-time contracts or indeed sort of temporary ones. But also we're always looking after the interests of the students. And I think that as long as we have the interests of the students, the interests of the, of the, of the academics, the teachers we work with, the interests of our staff, and always saying what's happening, what's new, and not be afraid of dropping things or altering things and trying things out. Um, I think this, this desire to adapt and to experiment is something that's very, very good. And we, we're normally able to do that more quickly than, than, than let's say, a department. the other, other departments in the university. Mm -hmm. How yeah. do you see the future of your language centre? Well, uh, at the moment, uh, the new strategic plan of the university has been launched. And uh, it sounds fantastic because language is in, on every page because yeah. it's internationalization, it's English programs, it's, well, uh, service for students and everything. So if we actually manage to mm -hmm. help the university and come, um, come with our own initiatives, and uh, well, and ideas. Then I think, um, well, it's uh, can work. Of course, budget is another story, mm. but it's always we work within the whole complexity of situation. So uh, I think that's yes. It's at the moment the language center position seems to be one of the essential centers as a service provider because mm. of the focus on uh, languages as such or international communication. Okay. Basically. My final issue is Vulko. So how, how did Vulko actually feature in, in what you've been doing over the last eight years? Because it's, we are in the, in the eighth year of mm. Vulko. Um, I'll give you a really recent um, example of how useful it's been for me. That um, because I'm um, retiring, um, certain things are being sort of finished off, which I'm really pleased about. And one of those is that the Language Centre... We've always been listed alongside academic departments, but we're now actually going to be considered equivalent to an academic department, which means our funding timing will be far better than in a non-academic department, which has, everything was out of kilter. But one of the um, important documents I submitted to show how we fit in, to show that we think alongside other universities outside of the UK, was a, um, the publication where we put all the first five yeah. um, memoranda together. And I was really surprised how one particular um, pro-director of the LSE, who is not a linguist, he's a northerner, he's a mathematician, <laughs> finance. And I remember him saying, I read that, I read it cover to cover, and it makes sense. There you go. <laughs> that is so good. He said, why do other departments do that? I've read nothing like that. And um, it was really, really interesting how it, it, it's, it can sometimes, the fact that we're dealing with real problems, real issues, yeah. management issues, and people don't get that. He thought we were just about language teaching. And the fact that we had this management expertise and awareness okay. of the issues made a big difference. Transferable so, knowledge to other, to other areas, absolutely. right? That's what we have. No. You're a newcomer. To work yes. off. Uh, the se your second time. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> to any <my> impacts? <laughs> well, of course. Well, my first walk off was the biggest change <laughs> I could <laughs> ever imagine because before coming to walk off, I was just thinking of a director's job as well, there'll be a lot of administration, it'll be a terrible job dealing with uh, money, paperwork, and this kind of thing. And I came to walk off and found a lot of creative people talking about wonderful uh, ideas that can be put into practice and, and the network of uh, people who are helpful really to one another, it's just changed the whole idea and I think I said it at the end of last week of that uh, I started to look forward to the job and, and that's really Thank you very much. On this merry note <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll come, we've come to the end of our um, 
discussion and hopefully we've provided you some insights into the workings of, in one sense, very different contexts, but at the same time, very similar challenges. And thank you very much for watching and keep in touch. <laughs> okay. <laughs>